So when I set off on my sabbatical at the beginning of January this year, I decided to call it a pilgrimage to wholeness. And you know what, Grant? I think we'll just have the chalice up there for us. Thank you. So why, you may wonder, a pilgrimage to wholeness? And what does wholeness even mean in terms of as a human being? So I set the intention that this trip would help me deepen my understanding of the spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental aspects of life, that it would allow me to somehow become more fully myself. And from that whole undivided place, I imagined I'd be able to show up in the world with more wholeheartedness and authenticity, with greater reserves of peace, kindness, and compassion to give. And feeling whole within might allow me to bring more love and light and thereby be of greater service to the world. And there was also a hope that this sabbatical would allow me to integrate aspects of my life that felt like they were missing, like finding misplaced pieces of the puzzle of my life. And I wanted to be fully embodied, whether it's exploring what it means to live in a physical body, doing yoga or dancing tango or hiking the Camino. And I wanted to see what the soft animal of my body, as Mary Oliver says, likes and wants. And I also yearned to deepen my spiritual life, to learn to trust in the rhythms of life and the flow of life more fully. So part of this journey would be an actual spiritual pilgrimage, the famous Camino de Santiago, both in France and Portugal. And in addition, I felt somewhat hollow because I never sensed much connection to my own heritage. And so I hoped to learn more about my ancestors and understand my German roots. And I'll share more about that in our month of heritage in October coming this year. So the whole sabbatical, in fact, this whole year so far, has felt like one long pilgrimage to wholeness. Now, as Zen priest and activist Angel Kyoto Williams tells us, for us to transform as a society, we have to allow ourselves to be transformed as individuals. And for us to be transformed as individuals, we have to allow for the incompleteness of any of our truths and a real forgiveness for the complexity of human beings. So what I assumed would be a blissful exploration that would allow me to emerge feeling more congruent and peaceful turned into quite the roller coaster ride, as some of you know. A real heroine's journey with a descent and then an eventual gradual re-emergence. So my warning is, be careful what you ask for in life. But then again, perhaps it was naive to expect spiritual growth and transformation without some setbacks and major life lessons. And in hindsight, it actually might have been a rather a liability to call my sabbatical a pilgrimage to wholeness because what I forgot in calling for that was that wholeness necessarily involves brokenness. And as the theologian and Quaker philosopher Parker Palmer shares in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, wholeness does not mean perfection. Wholeness means embracing all that is broken in you and embracing it as part of the whole of you. Now, many religions offer pilgrimages as a way to deepen your spiritual and devotional life. Inspired by the Prophet Muhammad, millions of Muslims yearly undertake the Hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca. And it's one of the five pillars of Islam and an essential practice as a Muslim. Meanwhile, Christians undertake various pilgrimages, including ones to the Holy Land or the infamous Camino de Santiago, which I mentioned, which offers a variety of routes from several countries, all ending up in the stunning cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. 
And of course, Jesus' pilgrimage took place in the wilderness while fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, which is honored in the Christian tradition with the season of Lent. And Prince Siddhartha undertook his pilgrimage out of his palace and into the world, which ended up with his enlightenment as the Buddha. And of course, the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, invites pilgrims to journey to all the holy places in India. But pilgrimage goes back even further to the ancient Greeks, Israelites, Sumerian, and Mayan civilizations. And they offer a tool for turning inward and deepening our spiritual lives, learning profound lessons, and then returning transformed. So classically, I want to talk about the six steps, six stages of a pilgrimage. First of all comes the call. And it usually appears in the form of a longing or a yearning within or a calling to find greater meaning and depth and understanding in life. And it may come as a spiritual calling for a deeper connection to your sense of the holy. Next, pilgrims encounter the separation. You know you must leave behind your day-to-day, -day, your ordinary existence, to travel to a deeper place within yourself. And pilgrimage intrinsically rejects certainty and the known in favor of being in the moment and an unclear future. And then the third stage is the journey. And inevitably, the journey involves sacrifice and suffering of some kind. I thought I could do it without, but what was I thinking? <laughs> Pilgrims are often subjected to physical challenges and encounter emotional hurdles, being far from the comforts of home. And then pilgrims undertake the stage of contemplation. With the removal of the known, we make space to drop into our deepest inner knowing or our connection to something greater than ourselves. And it's an opportunity to listen and reflect deeply, to journal and to question. And then the fifth stage invites the encounter. And this is either the zenith or the low point of the journey. And I had the latter. The space where your old self disintegrates, and where you have a major initiation of some kind, and you are reborn in some way. And finally, there comes the completion and return. And the pilgrim finishes the journey and returns home, integrating the lessons, and finds new meaning in the ordinary gifts of life. Now, my pilgrimage had all these stages. I felt a strong call to deepen my understanding of life and spirituality. In fact, for over a year, I was preparing for this sabbatical, both with you as a congregation and personally, knowing that there were important things that I needed to learn. And then came the stage of separation. And it began with a series of cancellations. As some of you know, I was due to go on silent retreat to ring in the new year and set my intentions for the sabbatical. But the road to my retreat washed away the night before during one of our many deluges this winter. And so the first leg of my sabbatical was canceled. And letting go of that vision and surrendering to the unknown was my first big lesson. The next leg, a few days later, was also a bust. I was due to go away with my husband for a few days before I left on my travels. But the morning of our departure, I came down with COVID. So that was canceled too. Immersively, I had exactly 10 days to recover before flying to Buenos Aires to learn to dance tango. And then my physical pilgrimage began. Though hugely challenging in a foreign place where I didn't speak the language and I knew nobody, as many of you know, this was a long-awaited dream of mine. And it was a way to explore the embodied aspect of wholeness. And then came the contemplation stage of my journey with the ancestral healing chapter, 
learning about my past and my ancestry. First, I went back to England to visit with friends and relatives, and then on to Germany to realize what it means to actually be 100% German by blood. You guys might not know that about me, but I actually am 100% German by blood, which explains a lot, but... <laughs> <laughs> And this actually deepened some of my understanding of life, of who I was and where I'd come from, while also being a painful confrontation of a difficult heritage. Visiting concentration camps and sites of Nazi rallies, as well as countless museums about Germany's past, I spent many nights in tears facing the heaviness of my heritage. Nevertheless, this leg of my pilgrimage put in place some of the missing background and emotional pieces of my puzzle. Mercifully, after that, I continued on to France for the spiritual leg of my pilgrimage, and I dove into chanting at the monastery of Thézé and researched the Black Madonna along the route of the Camino de Santiago in France. Now, France has always felt like a spiritual home for me and the perfect place for engaging deeply with mystical questions and growth. And from there, I continued on to Portugal to walk the Camino, which presented the greatest physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional challenge. This is where I experienced the encounter phase of my pilgrimage. As I walked the Camino, as many of you know, three days in, I fell and broke both of my ankles and lost my ability to walk entirely for a few weeks. And this was really the most humbling moment of my journey, and I remember railing at spirit, saying, really, I didn't expect this. <laughs> And so once again, I had to release attachment to my plans, to my autonomy, to my capacities, and I had to embrace the stillness and lessons that the universe was offering me. By allowing life to flow in a different direction from what I imagined, I learned about the kindness of strangers and about resilience and about slowing down and listening deeply. And you know, many of you who know me, that slowing down, I had to actually break my ankles to learn that lesson. <laughs> so with broken feet, and then the other plot twist of ending my 20-year marriage upon my return, I hit rock bottom. And instead of being rested and restored, happy and whole, I landed in a plain, painful place. My whole life was shifting beneath me. I felt broken physically, mentally, emotionally, and traversing a dissolution of the ego and my life as I knew it. Though spiritually, I have to say, I felt strong, thanks to what had come before, and I was able to surrender to this liminal space. And throughout the ensuing months, this wasn't that long ago, I got back on April 15th, I dug deep to find reserves of inner strength and courage that I didn't know I had. Gradually, I began to walk again, both literally and metaphorically. And I've been reassembling my life in a new way, emerging slowly from the darkness by integrating my many lessons and finding new gifts, clarity and direction and also how incredibly important this community of love is to me. So I've been on the completion and return phase of my pilgrimage ever since. Now, I think my pilgrimage has echoes of the spiritual journey depicted in the ancient tale of Inanna from around 4,000 before the Common Era. Inanna, a Sumerian goddess of love, beauty, and wisdom, undertook a profound journey that echoes the challenges and transformations that we might experience on our quest for spiritual and emotional wholeness. Dwelling in her splendid kingdom, Inanna hears the call to embark on a sacred pilgrimage. 
Now, we might all recognize such a call to adventure in our own lives, where moments of dissatisfaction or longing stir within us, urging us to seek something greater or a fresh understanding of life and the universe. Now, often this call presents itself as a yearning for wholeness and fulfillment, pulling us out of our comfort zones to embrace the unknown. Inanna's journey unfolds as she descends into the underworld, a realm of darkness and mystery. Leaving behind her opulent palace and majestic symbols of power, she passes through seven gates, each one requiring her to surrender a piece of her individuality. And at each gate, a gatekeeper takes away a symbol of her identity, ultimately leaving her stripped of all her outer trappings. At the first gate, Inanna is asked to remove her crown, a representation of her authority. And this trial represents the relinquishment of her ego and the shedding of her attachment to external recognition and power. At the second gate, Inanna removes her earrings, which symbolize her ability to listen and communicate. And this trial challenges her to listen not only to others, but also deeply within to her inner voice and intuition. The third gate requires Inanna to take off her precious necklace, a symbol of her desires and her attachments. And this trial prompts her to let go of materialistic pursuits and recognize the impermanence of worldly possessions. At the next gate, Inanna removes her breastplate, her shield, rep representing her defensive armor. And this trial asks her to become vulnerable, letting go of her need to protect herself and revealing her authentic self. The fifth gate demands Inanna's girdle, which accentuates her beauty. And this trial compels her to confront societal standards of beauty and embrace her true essence beyond physical appearance. And then at the sixth gate, Inanna removes her ankle bracelets, which represent her power of movement and freedom. I was blown away when I read that. This trial challenges her to release her attachment to control and allow her life to flow. And finally, at the seventh gate, Inanna must shed her garments of desire, the last remnants of her old self. And this trial asks her to let go of all attachments, desires, and expectations that no longer serve her higher purpose. After passing through the seven gates, Inanna reaches the heart of the underworld, where she encounters her sister, Arishkagal, the queen of the underworld. And Arishkagal kills Inanna, and she hangs her lifeless body on a hook. During her three days in the underworld, Inanna experiences a deep, symbolic death, representing the dissolution of her old self. And of course, this has echoes of Jesus' death that would come 4,000 years later. This pivotal moment signifies the spiritual death of our ego selves, paving the way for a profound transformation and renewal. And these trials of death and rebirth symbolize the deep growth that takes place when one confronts one's own shadow and limitations. Eventually, I'm glad to say, Inanna's death is followed by a rebirth as she is resurrected with the help of divine intervention. 
She begins her journey back to the realm of the living, passing back through the gates. And as she reclaims the symbols that she's left behind, she integrates her newfound wisdom and experience. And she emerges as a goddess who embodies both light and darkness, having faced her shadow side and embraced her wholeness. However, her journey does not end with her ascent. She integrates the light and the dark, symbolizing the unity of all aspects of life. The philosopher and writer Gerald May says, blessings sometimes come through brokenness that could never come in any other way. And many of the trials I have faced, and I'm imagining you too, have resulted in unexpected blessings. And as I emerge from the depths of my dissolution, I'm really grateful for the many gifts of my pilgrimage now. And traveling back to the UK this summer helped me collect and integrate some of the jewels I had let go during my journey. And I participated in something called the Game of Transformation at the Spiritual Community of Findhorn in Scotland for a week. And that helped me integrate and understand my pilgrimage in a whole new way. And I'm going to share more about that, again, life-changing experience, <laughs> another Sunday in our month on transformation later this year. But what I learned was that a pilgrimage to wholeness doesn't conclude when we return and overcome our challenges. Because it's life, isn't it? There are always going to be more challenges, right? Aren't there? Yeah. A pilgrimage to wholeness asks us to confront our shadows, our failures, embrace our vulnerability, and acknowledge our imperfections. It requires us to reckon with our past, face our limitations, and undergo a symbolic death of our old selves. And only through such a letting go, my friends, can we be reborn, embracing a more authentic and awakened version of ourselves. But wholeness isn't a destination we arrive at. Perhaps it's something we journey towards all our lives on this spiral of life. Maybe we never arrive at a complete, enlightened, whole place unless we are Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad or even Inanna. Be broken to be whole, says Lao Tzu. Wholeness means accepting the setbacks we face in life and growing from them. Wholeness means integrating our shadow and becoming friends with it. Wholeness means loving ourselves enough through struggles and light, through our failures and our gifts, so we can accept those facets in others and in the world. Journeying towards wholeness, my friends, grows our capacity to love, to be authentic and live life undivided. It makes us better healers, better lovers, and justice warriors. It gives us the strength and resilience to approach life's ups and downs with grace, wisdom, and acceptance. I close with the words of the brilliant lawyer and human rights activist, Brian Stevenson. Our brokenness is the source of our common humanity, the basis for our shared search for comfort, meaning, and healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. My dear beloveds, may we embrace our brokenness as we all grow into more compassionate, loving, and whole people together. May we allow ourselves to face life's challenges and learn from them. And as we reflect on Inanna's journey and other pilgrimages, 
I invite us to consider our own pilgrimage to wholeness as a sacred endeavor and one of the reasons we're alive. May it be so. Amen.